Thank you. Uh, Harvard Bioscience is a little different to many of the companies you've heard about today. Uh, we're already a public company. We're 110 million in revenues, and we're very profitable, and you haven't heard that too many times in the last couple of days. Uh, most of our business, though, is a life science research tools business. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about today is our new regenerative medicine device business. So if you're, because we're a public company, if you are interested in investing in the company, of course, you need to read our 10Ks and our risk factors, safe, safe harbor statements. But what I'm going to talk about is a milestone we achieved earlier this year when our tools were used in conjunction with a surgeon at the Karolinska Institute called Paolo Macchiarini, who performed the world's first regenerated tracheal transplant. This is a story told in pictures. It's going to be a little different to some of the stories you've seen earlier on today. That's Paolo Macchiarini on the left there. On the right is the patient, Mr. Andamari and uh, Bayen. Uh, he was uh, diagnosed with tracheal cancer. He was given two weeks to live at the time of the surgery. The cancer had already grown to almost the size of a tennis ball in his throat and was occluding his trachea. He was condemned to die, according to Paolo. Um, this is actually a CAT scan of the patient's trachea. Uh, blue is the airway and the green is the tracheal cancer mass. So you can see just how large it was and how much it was impinging on his ability to breathe. It had reached six centimeters in length. Uh, if, if the tumor is less than two centimeters, it can be surgically removed. It cannot be surgically removed if it's more than two centimeters, and so the patients just die. There is no treatment or cure other than this therapy. The first thing after that CAT scan was, was made was a uh, mold was made of the, uh, both the bronchus, the two bronchi and the trachea. You can see it there upside down. This is in the uh, Karolinska facility. And uh, this was made to the exact size and shape of the, uh, the patient's trachea. The polymer here that was used to make it was a, a, a novel polymer made by a professor called Alex Ophelian at the uh, University College of London. Uh, this is our uh, bioreactor, or one piece of the bioreactor that we made. You can see the uh, stem cells is uh, simply a bone marrow aspirate. The mononuclear cells are disposed of, and the, the, uh, uh, the underlying stem cells are simply poured over the top of the tracheal scaffold inside the bioreactor. It then rotates on that shaft to provide shear stress, which is one of the key cues to turn the bone marrow cells into uh, the uh, cells that produce the cartilage. I also keep it sterile and body temperature and allows the cells to continually rain down on top of the scaffold. The scaffold is porous. The pores are about the same size as the stem cell. The stem cells uh, find their way down into those pores, and over about two days start to grow into each other with collagen formation. So by the time it's actually transplanted into the patient, it really is a piece of tissue. About five days after the transplant is revascularized and grown its own epithelium, and so at that point, I think it's fair to say it's really a new organ. This is what the graph looked like immediately prior to implant, with the uh, trachea end facing us and the, the bronchial ends uh, facing away from us. This is the last time we ever saw it. I was in the operating room for the procedure. I hope we never see it again for another 30 or 40 years, and Mr. Bayen has a long and healthy life. Uh, this is Paolo after the surgery. The beauty of this surgery is it does not rely on a donor organ, so there's no need to wait for someone to donate the organ. And uh, you can have it immediately. There's no need to wait for the patient. In a, in a situation like tracheal cancer, it's often diagnosed very late. The patients often only have a few weeks to live before the, uh, at the time of diagnosis. So timing is essential in this indication. Uh, the thing that Paolo does not say is there's no immune response either. Because it's using the bone marrow from the patient and the scaffold is inert, there's no immune response from the patient. So there's no immunosuppressive drugs required. And a uh, quote from, uh, from the patient shortly after the surgery, the difference between living and non-living. Uh, he was released from the Karolinska four weeks after the surgery, a very short period of time for recovery for a major piece of surgery like this. And uh, as of today, he's free of cancer for seven months post-surgery. Alan Russell, many of you may know him, director of the McGowan Institute, founding director of the McGowan Institute, gave this very nice quote after it. It's yet another demonstration of what was once considered hype, and there's been a lot of hype in the field of regenerative medicine. It's becoming a life-changing moment for patients. Uh, of course, we, he was not involved in the surgery. I, I wholeheartedly agree with his conclusions. This work has been published in The Lancet, one of the world's top medical journals, in November at almost exactly the same time as that paper was published. The second uh, patient was treated. That was November 17th. That says 2001. That should say 2011. Uh, Christopher Lyles was the second patient. He's an American citizen, and he traveled to uh, the Karolinska for the surgery. Um, that's, he's also made a similarly strong recovery, and in fact, he's been released from the hospital, and he will actually return to his home in Baltimore, Maryland, tomorrow. Um, so our business model here is to make the tools, 
we think there's a billion dollar revenue opportunity in the tools alone, the bioreactors, for uh, doing these kind of regenerated uh, transplants. And uh, with a billion dollar revenue opportunity, we view this as a blockbuster revenue potential. But unlike a stem cell therapy, it does not require anything like the amount of capital investment and is nowhere near the amount of risk that you have in a stem cell therapy. So we think this is a great way to add uh, value to our stockholders and, of course, to patients as well. I'm happy to take a couple of questions or turn it over to the whole panel discussion if you prefer, Jeff. Thank you. Any questions for, uh, for David before we open up questions to the panel?